Okay, so now we've moved up to a higher level of difficulty because all our previous examples were just elements from the first row, like hydrogen and helium and ions of those. But we need to be able to deal with elements from the second row as well. Well, here we're seeing how to do that. Now we have to break out a second level of orbitals and uh, form the overlap between them as well. Now, different instructors write these in different ways. Um, some so what I did here is we showed all of the molecular orbitals and all of the electrons. But some instructors prefer to write only the valence molecular orbitals and only the valence electrons. Wh which, of these, um, which of these levels is the valence level? And which are the core levels? Well, these are the core electrons, right? And these are the valence. So some instructors would leave out this whole bottom part of the table, and they would only draw the valence portion. Um, and that's why earlier I asked you how many electrons there were, and you said uh, each lithium was contributing one. Well, that would be correct if we were just focusing on the valence electrons. Now, I'm just looking at the example that your instructor did in the lecture notes. In the lecture notes, your instructor did all of the orbitals, both the valence and the non-valence. However, I wouldn't be surprised if in some other examples they only did the valence electrons. Why is it usually a good idea maybe to ignore the core electrons? Well, notice that the bond order from the core electrons is always zero, because by definition, all of the orbitals in the core are filled. That's what it means to be the core. Or all of the orbitals are filled. So any electrons in bonding orbitals are always going to cancel the electrons in the anti-bonding orbitals. So notice that suppose we had only focused on the valence electrons to find the bond order. If we were only focusing on the valence electrons for bond order, what would this number be? What would be the number of valence electrons in bonding orbitals? Two. Two. And how about in anti-bonding orbitals? Zero. Zero? Yeah. That would give us the same answer, right? One. So this is, this is the whole point of why in chemistry we tend to ignore the core electrons and just focus on the valence electrons. Because in the core, everything is filled, and the bonding always cancels the anti-bonding. Whereas you can see in the valence shells, you might have unfilled shells. OK. Um, so we'll see. As we go, I think I might eventually start leaving out the core electrons. Because again, they don't, they don't give us much extra information. But uh, for, a minute, for now, maybe we'll stick with them, because your instructor was drawing them. Um, a paramagnetic. Actually, I think I talked about last month. Yeah, I vaguely remember. I remember the terms. Paramagnetic means that you have one or more unpaired electrons. And diamagnetic. means that you have no unpaired electrons. So by unpaired, do you mean like lone pair? Or do you mean like not? It's easy to see that with an example. For example, would this be a paramagnetic or a diamagnetic once we look at the molecular orbitals? Well, notice that all the electrons here are paired. So it actually has nothing to do with being a lone pair or not. It's not the distinction between a lone pair and a bond. It's the distinction between a pair of electrons and a singleton electron. Well, this is a pair, this is a pair, and this is a pair. So this would be diamagnetic. If the picture had looked like this, then it would be paramagnetic, because one of the electrons would be unpaired in its orbital. So this is what an unpaired electron looks like. So that's actually a completely different idea from a lone pair. Um, so this would be a diam. Uh, so what would this? This would be a paramagnetic compound with one unpaired electron. But what we actually got with lithium was all paired electrons. So is lithium paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Diamagnetic. So these are just definitions that we need to memorize. Uh, unfortunately, paramagnetic kind of has the word pair in it, but it actually means unpaired. So that's an unfortunate coincidence. Uh, but if you remember that paramagnetic is the opposite of what it sounds like, then you would know that paramagnetic means one or more unpaired electrons. OK, so this is diamagnetic. It turns out that paramagnetic substances um, tend to be weakly attracted into magnetic fields. Paramagnetic substance tends to be weakly attracted into a magnetic field. And a diamagnetic tends to be even more weakly repelled. Oh, 
Yeah, oxygen is a very common example of talking about paramagnetism and diamagnetism, so it sounds like she might have been talking about that. Okay, so um, a diamagnetic substance is uh, quite weakly repelled by a magnetic field. And we'll, we'll just memorize those facts. So this is maybe an experimental way to check whether things are paramagnetic or diamagnetic, but now we can use our molecular orbital theory to predict whether something would be para or diamagnetic. All right, well, um, let's try beryllium. Let's try to draw the molecular orbital diagram for beryllium. So good? I think so. Good. Let's go ahead and do the, do the molecular orbital diagram. Oh, yeah, that part is where we got to. This seems all Okay, so beryllium is in this column of the periodic table. Uh, so let's see, it should have four electrons total. So we're still counting all the electrons, not just the valence electrons. One, two, three, four. We still don't need to use anything beyond the 1s and the 2s orbitals, so we would still use the same basic structure. So how many electrons do we have here total? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And uh, let's calculate the bond order. What was the bond order? Zero. Yeah, because what will be the numbers that I would put in here? 1, 2, 3, 4. So the theory predicts that this molecule doesn't really exist or is not stable. Let's see what the textbook says. Uh, the bond order is zero, thus the model predicts that Be2 is not more stable than separate Be atoms, so no molecule should form. However, experiments indicate that Be2 gaseous does exist, although it has a very weak bond. Um, okay, so one other point is the thing that we mentioned again at the beginning, all of these approaches are just models. None of these models are perfect ways of actually describing the way the molecule works. All of them um, work well, um, give you the right answer sometimes and not the right answer in other cases. So in this case, it turns out that the model is giving us a somewhat misleading um, uh, answer. It's saying that we should not have BE2 at all, 
and it turns out that you actually can have stable BE2. But the model is still pretty close because it turns out that it's only very, very weakly bonded. If you do get BE2, it's only a very weak bond. Okay. Uh, you wouldn't be expected, I don't think, to have that experimental fact memorized. You would just be expected to see what the model predicts here. So the model predicts a bond order of zero. Uh, 